I'm reading from the message version, Matthew 25, starting at verse 31, the sheep and the goats. When he finally arrives, blazing in beauty, with all his angels with him, the Son of Man will take his place on his glorious throne. Then all the nations will be arranged before him, and he will sort out the people, much as a shepherd sorts out the sheep from the goats, putting sheep to his right and the goats to his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, enter you who are blessed by my father. Take what's coming to you in this kingdom. It's been ready for you since the world's foundation. And here's why. I was hungry and you fed me. I was thirsty and you gave me a drink. I was homeless and you gave me a room. I was cold and shivering and you gave me some warm clothes. I was sick and you stopped to visit. I was in prison and you came to me. Then those sheep are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry and feed you? Thirsty and give you a drink. Did you ever, did we ever see you in prison or come to you? Then the king will say, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you did any one of these things for the overlooked or the ignored, that was me. You did it for me. And then he will turn to the goats, the ones on his left, and say, Get out, you worthless goats. You were good for nothing but the fires of hell. And why? Because I was hungry and you didn't give me a meal. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was homeless and you gave me no bed. I was shivering and cold and you didn't give me any warm clothes. Sick and in prison, and you never visited. Then those goats are going to say, Master, what are you talking about? When did we ever see you hungry or thirsty or homeless or shivering or sick or in prison? And we didn't help? And he will answer them, I'm telling you the solemn truth. Whenever you failed to do this to one of these people, one of these someones who were being overlooked or ignored. That was me. You failed to do it for me. Then those goats were herded to their eternal doom, but the sheep to their eternal reward. God add his blessing to these words. Will you please join me in prayer? Oh God, come to us in the quietness of the places where we find ourselves at this very moment. Center our hearts and our minds on you and you alone. Open us to the power and to the presence of your Holy Spirit and remind us that your love, mercy, and grace Come to us unasked for and free. Amen. There is a special joy when you reach the end of a good book that you've been reading. I don't know about you, but I love a, a, a page turner that devouring that good story to the last chapter. I just finished reading several books this past week, one for pleasure. In fact, I commend to you um, 
the diary of a pastor's soul, the holy moments in a life of ministry by M. Craig Barnes, particularly my clergy friends will enjoy this one. I've also finished six other books that are lectionary resources that I read in preparation for the coming week's worship service. Now, I have arrived at the final chapter in each of these six books because today marks the final Sunday in our liturgical year. And next Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent, is the start of a brand new church year. And here you thought January was the start of a new year. I guess I had you fooled. The Revised Common Lectionary splits the weekly scripture readings into three major divisions, year A, B, and C. And then from there, subdivides the readings each Sunday. So there will include an Old Testament, a Psalm, an Epistle, and a Gospel reading of each, in each of those Sundays. So every year, A, B, and C, um, Matthew, Mark, or Luke are the focused or the premier gospel readings for the year. And interestingly, the, the gospel of John is read here and there throughout the course of all three years. So it's a three-year lectionary cycle. So if you were to read all four of those readings every Sunday throughout the course of a three-year period, you would have read or heard read aloud from worship um, about 80 or 85 percent of the entire Holy Bible. So for those who of, for those who follow the lectionary, and this is a choice, by the way, not a requirement, worship leaders have that freedom to, to focus on any one of those four readings as the basis of the message. And for those that have been following us along, you'll know that I've been kind of narrowing in on Matthew um, since I started here. So we've come to this uh, end of year A in the Gospel of Matthew. Um, and today's reading that Carol just read is the final chapter of that page turner that we've been reading since I started. And I must admit, you, didn't just, you just heard it. I'm sure you'll admit too. I'm not liking this chapter. I mean, initially, I, I found myself shaking my head in kind of bewilderment, like, what, 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 what just happened? This is hardly a kind of a, a happily ever after ending um, of our page-turning gospel that, that we've been reading the past seven months. So Jesus, just kind of recap, Jesus had been giving his uh, disciples um, a kind of farewell instructions or a pep talk, if you will, uh, before he faces death. And actually, those are the kind of the chapters um, that do come after what we, what we just heard. Um, but those readings occur in, in Lent. So we've already read those early on, but that's kind of spoiling my image here, but okay. So pep talk. And he's essentially telling his disciples um, what to expect. To prepare for his return. And we don't know when that's going to be. It's going to be unexpected, Jesus' return. So today's reading, for those that have been in church for a while or a connoisseur of reading scripture, these really are f familiar. It's a familiar story to all of us. But well, as much as these are familiar words, these are also words that make us very uncomfortable. Not just in the church, but I would dare say all over the world. It's uncomfortable. Well, why is that? Because these are words of judgment. And who among us likes to be judged? Being judged is very uncomfortable. Now, I have mentioned in the past, at probably more than one, on more than one occasion, that living the life that Jesus asks of us is a tough act to follow. And this, and in this reading, 
in this reading, the check for our meal has arrived. Big gulp. The passage opens with this vivid description of the Son of Man coming in glory, accompanied by the angels, seating, seated on his throne. The nations are all gathered round and separated into two groups. Jesus is portrayed in his glorious return as a shepherd, an image that is described throughout the Gospel of Matthew. Now, interestingly, in Jesus' times, uh, the shepherds routinely had mixed flocks of sheep and goats together. And at night, they would separate, the shepherd would sh separate the sheep from the goats. So this, this is what makes it a very familiar story to the first century. Because the sheep enjoyed the open air and being out in the pasture during the night, but yet the goats... The goats really, they needed protection from the cold, and that's why they were brought in. Now, sheep had more commercial value than goats, so therefore they were preferred. As shepherd, the Son of Man separates the sheep who are placed on his right hand from the goats who are placed on his left. Now, we know the images offered in today's gospel lesson uh, speak of final judgment with the goats being separated from the sheep. Hmm. But, but, rather than hear this as judgment and condemnation that we don't measure up, what if what if we heard this text as encouragement and an opportunity to respond to this world in new ways? Think about that. What if, rather than hearing this as judgment and condemnation, this is an opportunity for us to respond to the world in new ways. So this familiar story points out that we simply do not know when we will encounter the face of Christ next. We do not know, thus making every ground that we walk on holy. Think about that. Rather than reading this text with the lens that is designed to scare us straight, maybe these words are meant precisely to remind us that in every encounter that we have, it could be the face of Christ. When did you see the hungry and feed them, thirsty and give drink? And when did we see the sick or visit those in prison? Whenever we did one of these things to someone overlooked or ignored, that was me, says Jesus. That was me. You did it to me. Wow. I've been privileged in my life to serve in many roles that has brought me um, up close and personal with the homeless, the mentally ill, the injured, the dying, and the incarcerated. As a military policeman, criminal investigator, a local police officer, a psychiatric social worker, and finally as pastor, I have seen things and been places that not many have gone. 
This work has not always been joy-filled, but it is with the lens of faith that I served and continue to serve. I oftentimes shake my head and wonder, how is it that, that I am so privileged, so fortunate in my life, and others are less fortunate and destitute? Like many of you, I live a comfortable life. I have a place I call home. I have plenty of food to eat. I have a good paying job that I love, by the way. I'm in good health. Why me? Why any of us? Think about that. It is tempting to think of our material comfort as a divine blessing. Our lives are comfortable. But I think that has more to do with our social position and not an awful lot to do with God. Yes, many of us are greatly privileged. Whenever a new minister was ordained in the main conference of the United Church of Christ, the, the former conference minister, the Reverend David Gajewski, would always say to him or her, this newly ordained pastor, your role as a pastor is to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. These words have stayed with me. This text should not be read simply as our humanitarian call to work on behalf of those on the margins of society, but rather, as Emily Edson writes, is an invitation to grow our spiritual coats. Because really, it's not a matter of just throwing money where there is a need to, to solve whatever problem that we encounter. It is an invitation, an invitation to make sure that we are spreading love and being spiritually formed by love. Not doing good works out of guilt or fear, but in preparation and rejoicing over the love that is coming into the world. So we have come to the end of another liturgical year, and now we prepare for Advent. Beverly Zink Sawyer's question is fitting at the end of this year and opens our hearts to what lies ahead. Quote, what could be more surprising than God who comes to dwell with us in the form of a poor, helpless child born in obscurity to peasant parents? Indeed, God came to us as one of the least of these and still does, end quote. We should be wise then and watchful and ready is what Advent's all about. So I don't know whether we are sheep or goats, but I do know, I do know, that the ground we walk on is holy. What can we do to make a difference in this world? Well, certainly in the context of what is going on in our world today, with the increasing number of coronavirus cases kind of out of control, we can make a difference by simply washing our hands, keeping a physical distance, wearing a mask to cover your nose and mouth, follow the CDC guidelines so we can tap this down until The vaccine has been released. Those little things, those little things are going to make a huge difference. So that's certainly why, and part of the protocol, as we do in-person worship, these specific protocols, these are all little things, but they will all matter. Certainly for our safety, as well as the safety in the community. 
They're going to make a huge difference. But I, you know, what else can we do to make a difference? You know, honestly, I think it's the basic things that we can do to make a difference. Like looking into the eyes of the people we encounter. Looking into the eyes of the overlooked and the ignored. Looking into the eyes everywhere you turn, every day. Because that is where we will see the face of Christ. When we least expect it. And you know, by doing so, that simple little thing, looking into people's eyes and doing that, We'll be changed. You know, I guess that's not a bad ending to the story after all.